Ask Us Anything around the Global Mobilization Creator DLC for Armor 3. I'm Moncat, also known as Julian, and with me here I have the other half of the GM development team, Lars, also known as Galcon T. Hi. And today we are supported by Tini from Brazil, one of our trusty helpers, who will ask the questions that we have gathered over the last month and will inquire further when necessary. We will take you today on a quick journey of about one hour into the archives and development history of our DLC, GM. For those of you who are just listening, you will probably miss out on some juicy footage that we have put into the background here, showing off some scrapped concepts, cancelled projects and ideas and history and footage from the development itself. And with that, I think we can start right away. Alright. <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, here comes the important part of this meeting. Yeah, let's... I, I, I noticed some problems here. <laughs> <laughs> if we can... <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Alright, let, let me... Let me go and reading down the other questions. Uh, just, oh <laughs> God damn, Look at how you made it become. All right, all right then. All right. Okay. So this question comes from DK. What happened to the bridge layers? It has been released in 1.4. It... Amazing. Simple as. <laughs> Simple as. I right. thank you, DK. Okay, okay. After they stopped falling apart. Um, we decided to actually put them into release, but it was definitely a long road to get it there. I, I, I think the first version of it was more or less playable six years ago, seven years ago. I, I really don't remember. Um, but it was always one of the cornerstones of, of GM or what GM was before it was GM. Um, fine piece of technology that at some point has to find its way to the public. It influenced the map design in quite a big way. That's why we have the rivers and they are all conveniently spaced in their width. So the, the river's width is just enough for a beaver bridge to cross it. So Not having it was quite annoying in the release version of GM because we had the entire map kind of laid out for together with the destructible bridges themselves, which through the map design, we we allowed uh, a problem to be dynamically created, which is a river obstacle or a destroyed bridge. And then we didn't offer any remedies for that problem. But now with 1.4, we, we're looking to bring the bridge layers finally in game. All right, next question. What determines which of the real existing vehicles you put into the DLC and which you do not? Mm. I would say it's it's mainly a effort versus gain balance uh, which is also for example why in 1.0 we had the m113 in the game and not the mada as with a m113 we're simply able to to do so many more things than with just the mada um, and this is more or less how we make our decisions for pretty much every vehicle what additional benefits do we get can we either create more versions of it or can we reuse it for potential other factions or nations? And uh, that's pretty much the, the most important question we ask ourselves when we determine if a vehicle finds its way in or not. So, this one's a pretty cool one. What made you choose the Cold War East and West German theme for the CDLC? Was it always planned to be like this or... What's the deal? What's the catch? It's always been the coolest topic of warfare, in, in my personal opinion. It just has the coolest movies, the coolest equipment, and it doesn't... It's not this hyper-technological, informational warfare style where, you ha where everyone has thermal cameras and you get drone strikes from somewhere across the ocean. It's... It's just the right level of, it's a personal conflict. And the aesthetics, the music, people wear moustaches. Um, <laughs> that's, the, that's the appeal that I always had with it. 
yeah, for me, it's it's. I grew up during the Cold War, so having tanks and trucks and and uh, columns of of military vehicles drive through my my home villages on a not exactly daily basis, but on a on a regular basis, definitely had a, a huge impact on 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 my life and and uh, later career decisions. And uh, growing up as an army child, so to say, um, I've always been exposed to military and military material and vehicles throughout my entire childhood within the Cold War, uh, which obviously left the impression on me that the vehicles used during the Cold War are the tip of the spear, uh, the, the, the best stuff that has ever, ever been there. Um, and... Uh, it, the conflict where these uh, uh, vehicles would have seen combat would have been a Cold War gone hot. So if I would want to create my favorite military vehicles in a computer game, such as Arma, the conflict they would fight in would not be in Afghanistan, would not be some modern setting, it would be the Cold War gone hot. Uh, so the decision was pretty simple, because the vehicles I like simply fight in that time frame okay so next question is a pretty cool one what's your favorite vehicle in gm and why uh mine has to be the 10 ton truck because it always was also in the armor 2 german armed forces and the reason is just like trucking around with a big bad truck now i'm quite glad that in 1.4 we finally have a 10 ton truck that's slightly more useful uh, the flatbed version always could do transport vehicle and vehicle, but now we also have a big ammo truck with lots of artillery grenades on it. So that makes it probably also a nice target and a nice scenery vehicle. So everyone is probably going to expect me to say the looks. Well, it is the looks, but uh, actually it is also the Bieber, the bridge layer. Um, not mainly because I like the vehicle, the most because that's definitely the looks but because the amount of work and effort that went in, that went into making it work just makes me like that vehicle the most and that's why i'm super happy that it's a 1.4 all right that's a good one okay so the next question is relatively similar but i'd say it's a little bit tricky what's your favorite thing in gm Telerate computer devices that we've added <laughs> and they are just stereotypical large computers with spinning magnetic tapes and blinking buttons and they sometimes make noise they're just perfect scenery objects that look big bad and and like they they, they radiate this computation power of the 1980s that you need to have those in anything that's 80s ever I'm still thinking of a thing. Oh, the amount of logo research that went into the, the Euro palette was definitely uh, not to be neglected. So yeah, I'll say the Euro palette is definitely my favorite thing because it's also very accurate. The measurements are the way they're supposed to be. It's made up of right angles, so it's very, very German, and I do like it indeed. <laughs> nice. You, you want to know what's one of my favorite things in GM? Go for it. The cigarette machines. That, that reminds me, another thing I really do like, which is not necessarily a thing to grab in GM, but the fake company register we made to, to give GM a bit of a solid background. Fake companies for all sorts of things that manufacture scopes, cigarettes, beer... Uh, weapons and so on. Yeah, that that's that's another thing I really do like about GM. If you could add one feature to Arma, what would it be? Very simple. A way for commander and gunner to properly do command override. So the commander can take over the turret of the gunner and steer left and right. So that we can do proper commander slash gunner tankery. I, I really miss underground lot technology. The ability to build structures that go below the terrain surface, which would allow us to do basements, 
any kind of dug in bunkers, trenches properly, um, little ditches by the side of the road would probably be something that I would have done with that technology. So yeah, I really do miss miss that in Arma. What was it like trying to recreate a one-to-one -one location into Arma? It was a fun thing to do, and it's not. Uh, it's, it wasn't the first time that I have recreated real terrain in armor, but this was the first time I've stuck to a one to one scale ratio and with the added uh, difficulty of it being something that is essentially 30 years outdated because the terrain, the real Wefeling area, has changed massively since the time when we depict it, which is specifically the summer of 1983. And I do have a large array of maps uh, that were original maps printed in East Germany that were classified at the time that I've used to recreate the area with to make sure that the villages have the correct spacing, uh, that the actually the village names at the time, because some villages changed their names since the reunification, and also have some roads that maybe no longer exist. So it's not a one-to-one -one recreation of current day real Wefeling, and it's a recreation of what my historical research has uh, unearthed that I could have access to. You're restricted, of course, by something that is real, and it's simply there's no airfield there. There used to be an airfield during World War II, a, a, a grass runway, nothing else. That is now what on the map is called Marienthal in Braces Horst, and it was a airfield attached to a military base but that has been even in the i think in the 50s been converted to public civic housing so it's not a military base at all since a long time um, another idea of that is of the recreation in reality is that we have to find landmark buildings and recreate them as much as possible for that, we do have the salt mine, um, the church in Wefeling itself, obviously the inner German border, which I try to be as accurate as possible. And not, not all landmarks that we have identified that we wanted to create were actually created. There's a very nice manor house in Zegede, which is actually something that you get passed in the campaign as well in the tank. Um, that was originally planned to be built, but it was just such a monumental task. Uh, because it's such a big building, everything, of course, everything we did in GM is fully enterable. So having a big manor house that is partially enterable would be not such a good idea. We, we wanted to be claiming, be able to claim that all buildings are fully enterable. So eventually we just cut that from, from, yeah, from, from the list of things that we wanted to do. And saved a bit of time that we could invest in other things at, the, at that time. So recreating one-to-one, -to, -one, to summarize it, you never get it perfect, you never get it the way you want it, but you, you have to get close enough where you say, I'm content with it. So next question is still map related. Do you want to release another map for GM in the future? Was Wefferlingen the only potential map to be developed for the CDLC or was there another one? There wasn't just one. <laughs> yeah. So we originally settled on Wefalingen itself quite early. Um, I will actually see if I can, can dig that up because originally the first Wefalingen terrain was just 10 by 10 kilometers. And it was essentially what is now the lower left, the lower western, so south southwestern area of the map. That is roughly what it was still keeping the border on it. But then we realized, wait a minute, we're going to develop a map that has the, the primary focus of mechanized warfare, long distances that you cover fast with tracked vehicles. So the 10 by 10 kilometer terrain really wouldn't cut. And this was all before we were a DLC, a CDLC. So I edited, like, uh, tore my hair out basically and, and had to scrap all the progress I've made at the time and start from scratch on a 20 by 20 kilometer map. And that is the Wefalingen version that we now eventually released with. And well, you can freely access this now in, in 
with the uh, workshop data or you can play on it when you have the CDLC, of course. However, there are two more terrain prototypes that happened after the release. And the first one is set in Peenemünde, which is the most likely people will know about it, the World War II rocket factory. And it may sound a bit weird, like why, why would we do Peenemünde? But if you look at the map in reality, we have this big, massive air force, uh, air base there with really nice Russian planes, of course, that we could add as part of this um, map. And there's a freaking nuclear power plant on it. That's the perfect target for Spec Ops amphibious landing missions. Um, so we developed this fairly far. Um, I would still call what we what I have, have what I've done of it a a prototype build still. Um, there's one village built out quite far, um, but we never really pursued it later on. And the reason for that is because there's not much not much else to do on the map other than invading the airfield or the nuclear power plant or fighting over this one or two villages. So I wanted to then rework the map to maybe include a bit more terrain to the south of it to give it a bit more of a land warfare aspect as well. And then suddenly I'm looking at half a year, a year of development time again. Because one of the reasons why I picked it as well was that a lot of the area would be water, which doesn't really need that much care and attention paid to it because it's submerged in the water. So that's why this prototype never went any further. The, the, the idea as part of this Penamunda map was also to, to build up the naval assets of GM as well, have some landing crafts, potentially some, some, some gunboats and that kind of stuff as well. The other, the second map, was placed in the Sauerland. So that is close to the West German capital at the time, Bonn. And that is almost the polar opposite to Weferlingen, because that is just hills over hills over hills. And canyons, canyon-like uh, valleys, and military bases around. And one particular base was actually there uh, in two halves, or two parts that was part of the NATO integrated air defense net that had the Nike Hawk. No, it just had the Nike launchers, which were or could be nuclear tipped anti-aircraft missiles. And the idea was there that we built launch sites with the, uh, with the launchers themselves and the, the missiles and have that as a, a additional target for special operations or mission targets, that kind of stuff. And there I would also take the liberty of creating one or possibly two fake airports. So opposite directions of the map just have a bit more of a gameplay aspect to it. Because there for the for the Sauerland terrain, I wouldn't need to be able to 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 me like confidently claim that it was a truthful recreation of the time, of the area, of the buildings there, of the dominating features like the inner German border. And they were just too close to the border for reality, so we didn't want to sort of taint the, the flair of the map of being an authentic time travel piece, a digital museum of the area, by then having jarring inaccuracies. All right, Dan. Next question. What's the whole idea behind the potato launcher? How did Bohemia feel about it when they first saw it? It was actually an accident at first. Um... I imported the uh, P2 flare gun, but forgot that I scaled it up 10 times uh, for setup and to, to check some animation and stuff because it just illustrates better in, in uh, the tool when it's bigger. And I forgot to downscale it before I got it in game and it just looked hilarious and uh, Julian took it to the next level and created that hilarious and reload animation uh, and we decided to keep it in game. and. Uh, BI was actually very much amused by it and asked us to definitely leave it in the game because it's a fun piece of equipment. So next question, what are scrapped ideas and things that you wanted to put at GM but in the end you didn't add it? There were definitely a lot of little features and, and things that were in scope at some point uh, 
no normal armor player would would actually ever make use of them like setting the appropriate marching flags on vehicles blue red yellow uh green and that kind of stuff which at some point was all scoped out and and but um it doesn't didn't make any sense to put them into the final product as they are all script based and uh, the chance of them falling apart was definitely bigger than than the actual benefit but there were definitely a lot of Milzimi features that we were thinking of, of putting into uh, GM in the very beginning. Okay, I think this is it for that question. Now comes a really cool one. Besides Cold War Germany, what other setting would you pick? Mm -hmm. What equipments, what vehicles, why? So, so the reason why I would say Desert Storm is because from a vehicle aspect, to me, it's Cold War extended. It's the same kind of stuff. It's the same, same, same vehicle, same weapons in desert tan color, but it's essentially the same vehicles put into action. And uh, as uh, mentioned uh, in the previous question about why Cold War, for me, it has always been about the vehicles and the, the weapons and the assets used. And Desert Storm is exactly those vehicles, those weapons, used um just in a different setting so yeah for me the answer would definitely be desert storm which feature of vbs do you miss the most in arma so i would say again tank override so commander override i'm surprised that you say that and not the easy to use physics setup <laughs> okay the easy to use physics setup is definitely something I would I, I miss while setting up things. While playing things, definitely command override. But yes, I agree. Setting up physics vehicles in Arma is uh, lovely. Right, here comes the next question. Get ready. What books, documentaries, movies would you recommend to those interested in the Cold War in the 80s? So they can be more immersed in the GM historical context. I, I would say that's a difficult question, um, as it really depends on what you're after. There's definitely awesome pieces of fiction that get you very immersed into Cold War Gone Hot. One book, for example, I can recommend in uh, that regard is uh, World War Three by General Sir John Hackett. Um, I gifted one of those to Julian as well. That was a gift. I, I thought I need to return this. It's been here for many years. <laughs> you do not ever borrow books. You gift them. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a great book. And uh, it gets you very immersed of, of how uh, World War III would actually start out and, and how, from the perspective of, of certain individuals in such a conflict, it would look. And... Um, um, it definitely gets you into the mood, while not necessarily historically accurate, because it is a piece of fiction based on, on historical data. Um, it is definitely something I would recommend to just get in the, into the mood and, and, and into a certain mindset of, yes, let's go play GM. Um, obviously, there, there are a, a, a lot of those, those uh, kind of books that I can recommend, um, but... Best is, if you're really interested in Cold War, open your good old Google and type in Cold War. And uh, it will tell you everything you need to know. And if you want to dig deeper, there are always uh, uh, links that lead you farther and uh, that will get you started. So, next question. Do you enjoy making simple things more because they're easy or difficult things? Because they are a challenge. It really depends on the mood. Um, there's definitely the time when, when making simple things where you can see progress on a very, very... On a daily basis, essentially, uh, is, is very, very pleasing. But at some point, it just gets boring and you want to tackle something super complex again. And um, yeah, I, I, I think both have their place. All right, let's go to a fast subject. Are there any plans for more aircraft such as fast jets? I would definitely say there are no plans for them, but um, the way we work, we are sometimes overwhelmed by um, 
inspiration. And I think it's no secret that I am a huge fan of the F-104 Starfighter. And uh, if at some point I get overrun by uh, inspiration and energy, it might just happen without even being planned. All right, like, all right, let's go to the next question. Which army would you really like to depict in Arma, besides the ones you've already released in GM? That is a difficult question. A, a very strong contender for, uh, for this, uh, for me, is Norway. Uh, primarily because I am a huge fan of Norwegian vehicle camo, and uh, the Norwegian vehicle camo on a Leopard 1 looks simply amazing. Switzerland. It's, it's unique enough, it's weird enough, it's unusual enough that it hasn't been really done. I think there's the, there was the Swiss mod for Operation Flashpoint. Uh, that was I think so. I that think was so. really amazing, high quality. And the Swiss stuff, especially in the Cold War, they have a surprising amount of unique homemade content. And... In, in, in the words of a friend who described uh, the Swiss, Switzerland doesn't have an army. Switzerland is an army. And I want to one day recreate that a, a terrain would probably be the compensation for Wieferling and having the Alps or a bit of the Alps. And hopefully by then we get, uh, when that happens, we have the ability to do underground technology or dig into mountains, essentially. So we can have the, the big redoubts that the, the Swiss military has to, to stop invading enemies. That would be a very interesting topic for me. It's really hard to not hype the Swiss after watching that beautiful 1960s video they made. I believe it was nominated for an Oscar. Oh, well, it was extremely well made. All right. What was your biggest frustration with Arma's engine in regards to technical limitations? You know, that's, that's a, a difficult question uh, because we are dealing with this engine for such a long time. I would say we are definitely very familiar with it, so there weren't really any huge frustrations that we were not expecting. Um, but very frustrating, I would say, is definitely that there was no way to properly do trailers. At this point and um, trucks without trailers is only half of the trucking maybe in the future towing because there's a lot of there, there are a few new commands happening in 2.06 armor 3 version that may enable towing to be a more uh, mm, what's the word for the mm, safe way to use it there are sometimes some design decisions that I like to describe as uh, it's like you're running to the toilet and just when you reach it, it goes into your pants. It's like a, a solution is almost there and there's just one little thing that makes it not available. A cloth simulation has been in the armor engines since Operation Flashpoint because the little flag on, on cars and on the flagpoles doing capture the flag, they all are dynamically simulated. That's not a pre-rendered animation, but it's locked away in such a way that it cannot be used for anything else without extreme hacking and that's one of these cases where yeah they have the technology but it's not exposed enough not not use usable enough all right if there are any what would be the assets that are in gm right now that you didn't want to add but knew you'd have to add to the cdoc I don't recall a particular asset that I didn't like doing, but I know there were some, but I just can't recall which one. That's, that's uh, just how it is. I remember it was the Shadow Lot. Oh, God. That was definitely part of. In the be very beginning, we were making use of the Buffer Shadow, which uh, didn't require Shadow Lots. Uh, but <laughs> just a few days or weeks before 1.0, we decided to switch to the Stencil Shadows which definitely required uh, me to build a lot of shadow lots, which I definitely did not enjoy at all. But yeah, had to be done. What are your favorite mods for each of the ARM installments and Operation Flashpoint, excluding your own mods? 
Okay, now it's difficult. Very difficult. <laughs> so for for Operation Flashpoint, I must I must definitely say every thought everything from Ballistic Add-on Studio is definitely a must-have and and was pretty much things you always used when playing Operation Flashpoint, and uh, of course the BW mod back then. That that's essentially the two most important mods from my perspective. But uh, I must admit, Arma 1 was a very, very bumpy ride. I don't recall that much about it. And uh, Arma 2, well, there was Ace, obviously, but uh, primarily I played with uh, my own stuff back then. Uh, I also remember y Y2K3, which was mostly a collection of other mods doing a, a conversion of conflict replacement sound mod stuff. Uh, for Armor 2, we had a lot of our own stuff, but well, that doesn't count. And Armor 1, it's the same here, it's a very blurry time. And that's Armor 1 in, in comparison to Flashpoint and Armor 2 and definitely Armor 3 was a very short time. I think it only had two years between release in 2006 and when I started uh, beta testing Armor 2. In 2008, um, I was part of the official German support community at the time, so yeah. Okay, so 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 uh, so a good answer for this is the main reason why GM is a thing is because we wanted to recreate the Arma 3 that we wanted to play. Pretty much it, yeah. And at one point, it wasn't so sure if it was going to be even Arma 3 based or VBS based. I still, I still do have some pictures of the VBS-based prototype of GM. All right then. So next question, complicated one, I'd say. It's a big one as well. What's your view on the future of modding? Will it, will it inevitably make way for paid community add-ons like GM due to advancements in graphics and workloads? Or do you think that advancement in tools will keep it possible for hobbyists to make high quality assets? I think this is a very much a two fold thing. I don't think modding as a as a free community based modding will ever die out because it is simply how a lot of, of people who do it professionally get into this uh, uh, profession in the first place to just Take what you like and modify it at first, which is the definition of a mod, and uh, then just stepping up the game and, and trying to, to step into different areas of modding or add-on creation. And um, tools, advancement in tools definitely helps to keep up with the advancement of, of um, capabilities. But I do also think that... Uh, paid community content will also be a thing in the future. We can see it in various other games or platforms such as Flight Simulator, uh, DCS, etc., etc., where third-party developers are developing add-ons and content for some platform. And um, generally, I think it's a good concept. It, it's a contentious topic for sure. But... I don't think it has to be that. Um, I'd like to, to explain it this way. Um, the biggest fear that people have with so-called paid mods is that they will no longer get the content that they're used to, and instead they will have to pay for it. It gets paywalled in future titles, and when, when modding is more commercialized. And so they essentially feel like they're going to miss out unless they open the purse. And I don't think that will be the case. Uh, the workload, the quality that is almost, I would say, expected by the community from mod makers that do it for free is so high these days that it's a considerable amount of work. It takes a lot of free time out of a personal schedule. Having the ability to monetize it will allow this to actually happen and continue to exist. Um, 
So instead of, oh, content will now only exist paid, it will probably be something that it will only exist because it is paid. Would it not be possible to monetize it? It would just not exist. Okay. Going into the next question. What was the first 3D model you ever created? And what was the first mod you released? For me, the first 3D model I created was for Operation Flashpoint. And it was my attempt of uh, creating a Halo Warthog uh, for Operation Flashpoint. And uh, I'm sure if I'd look at that model now, unfortunately I don't have any pictures of it anymore, uh, I would probably say, oh my god, this looks so horrible. Um, but at least back then I was extremely proud of it, and I do think it was released. I started with a lot of civilian assets, and the first thing I did was a traffic sign. And that's how, that's how deeply rooted my terrain career, I would say, is that I've actually started making t custom terrain assets before I knew how to make terrains for Operation Flashpoint. Um, but I think it was a traffic sign. It might have been a construction barrier, like one of these barriers that you have when they dig up, dig up the road. And there was another thing, um, it was an advertising sign for electronic cash payment that I don't know why I did that. Maybe I'm the original life mod maker. I don't know. <laughs> so we have you to blame. I hope not. <laughs> I, I never released that. The, the first thing I released that I remember, uh, because there used to be a lot happening just in the forums of OFP info. There was mm -hmm. also OFPC and OFPEC. One was the German community, one was the international one. Um, I think I, I looked back through my, my forum posting history and the earliest release was uh, a terrain that had custom assets and a custom feature where you could actually go and sit on a bench. And I think that was 2005 or 2004. No, it must have 2005. Um, that was when I was finally good enough in English to, first of all, post about it in the international community and also confident enough to do that. Um, and I had good enough internet to actually upload something because, by God, the first mod we made was... Uh, I had my... God, like, I had help translating tutorials and tools and we downloaded something from Operation Flashpoint, ofp.info, that was called the add-on maker and at the time it was 10 megabytes of a tool and we only had dial-up internet. So that was a, a big deal getting that to download. And then it was all in English and we had no idea what we were doing. Um, so that must have been one of the first attempts in 2003, maybe 2002, possibly. Yeah, as I said, it's a long time ago. When, when did the, the, the first dev suit for for operation flashpoint released back then it was oh it the was, breathe uh, tools that was that was, was 2002 yeah before that so so my war talk was actually the first 3d model i attempted with with the with that software back then before that 3d modeling for operation flashpoint was hex editing uh, existing models which uh, was pretty much insane i had some uh, some attempts but they all kind of well, they never saw the light of the public. Yeah, the the, the holy crown of hex edited three D models is uh, someone converted the UH sixty model from Flashpoint to UH one. Yes, most amazing model in the beginning of Operation Flashpoint modding was amazing. Okay, then. Next question: um, What's your day to day like as an Arma developer? Do you separate specific times in your day to mod, or just happens? I would say it, it very much depends on where we are at in terms of um, GM development. Are we approaching a deadline, or are we just post-release, or, or where are we currently at? Um, I personally don't usually say okay, and now four hours of this, then three hours of that, three hours of that. Um, as you have to keep in mind, we do this next to our actual day job. 
which means uh, if the day job is very stressful, there might be no time spent on GM. Um, I also have a family, so if the family is very demanding on a specific day, there is not going to be a lot of GM development, and uh, I also don't want to neglect them. Um, but obviously, the closer it gets to a certain deadline, the more time has to be made available for GM development. Um, but also then, it's not five hours for that, five hours for that, five hours for that. But until then and then, this needs to be done. And if that means working the entire night, four times, six times, seven times in a row, then that's just how it has to be. Next question. Spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about this. I'm looking at one right now, but tell so, us more about so the spreadsheets. I'm, I'm going to very quickly go into my spreadsheets and see how many spreadsheets I have that are labeled with GM. And I can tell you it's a lot because there's pretty much for no matter what you can think of a spreadsheet. Name it, we have it. So, uh, yeah, just... Ammo designations, uh, national stock numbers, um, inventories, uh, NATO tanks, um, AI settings, um, and yeah, uh, GM uh, company register, uh, GM optics factions. Uh, um, so there is there are so many spreadsheets over here, um, and they are great to to organize things. Um, First of all, because you can multiplayer spreadsheet with them, which is amazing. So we can very easily across the, the, the team or just across me and Julian, we can synchronize where we're at with certain things. We can we can define standards, document them in a spreadsheet, and everyone has super easy access to it. Um, Julian even managed to very easily uh, create a uh, generate us our string table from a spreadsheet. Um, which makes it super easy for us to add new strings, translate them, um, because it's it's in one accessible sheet that everyone has access to and just needs to add to it. Um, and so yeah, GM is all about spreadsheets. Or trucks. Or trucks. Do we have do we have a spreadsheet about trucks? I do have a spreadsheet about the uh, MAN trucks i definitely do which lists all the versions with their internal company designation uh let me quickly bring it up to to <laughs> show what it's all about um so yeah the different camo variants where we can share the chassis with different versions because a seven ton variant of it is not necessarily the same one that is being used on all seven ton variants because there are various ones same for the five ton variants so yeah there's definitely a spreadsheet about trucks i'll ask the question then let's go what assets should gm have but make no sense to be added because of arma engineering tanks and recovery tanks they have absolutely no use but they look amazing I would like to add forklifts. <laughs> Typical. How influential was Arma to your career? Did you have any projects prior to creating content for the Arma franchise? Oh, it's been very influential for, for me. Um, this is something I've been doing essentially <laughs> I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary with BI Sim in, in September. And uh, I'm, I'm still fairly young, I would say, but I'm definitely one of the old guys because I've been around since the basically the origin, the original days of Operation Flashpoint modding. So I have a lot of insights and this is what I do nowadays as well. I optimize the tool workflow for, for the internal artists and I know exactly these pitfalls. I know the, the typical armorisms of, of how to work around them or how to even avoid them from the first place. And yeah, it's definitely been a very, very um, integral part. I can't agree more. Um, similar to me, while I definitely did do other work than just uh, Arma, 
or Operation Flashpoint. Uh, Operation Flashpoint definitely had a huge impact on my life. Um, um, who would have thought that uh, when I first bought this uh, this game, was it 2001, um, that at some point later I would essentially be using that engine or working with that engine to, to uh, essentially um, earn my daily bread. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely say it has had a huge impact on my life. All right, next question. Uh, this is a cool one. If you could have seen one West German prototype, anything, interactive service, so it could be part of the GM DLC, what would it be? I would say the Radpanzer 90. Which is essentially a wheeled tank, uh, 8x8, with a uh, sort of Leopard 1A3 turret on top of it. And it is an amazing vehicle. And uh, I think it would have its place in GM. Being a prototype or not, it doesn't matter in that case. Gee, there's just so many to choose from. But I gotta say then the one that I assume Lars would say, which is the Jagd Leopard. <laughs> Was that ever a thing? The Jagd Leopard? Uh, not really. So um, there were some concepts with the elevated platform with uh, hot missiles uh, based on a leopard chassis. And that is definitely an amazing thing. Um, so if we ever... Uh, need to implement uh, elevated ATGM platforms, it would be uh, that, I suppose. Okay, G11 was not mentioned. Okay. The, the G what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> the G11. No comment. Next question. I was just kidding, actually. It was, it was just a joke. <laughs> Just a joke. All right. Is that the designation Next. for the fall? <laughs> I think I think you have one one too many. You mentioned a keyword right now, my colleague Julian, because next question is what content pitch have you liked the most so far? There's been an amazing one about a G1. Oh, was there? Yes. It hasn't turned into anything yet, but it was quite amazing. Maybe. It's uh, it's for me. It's the MI two, which I then ended up building in all its billion variants. I think eleven or thirteen by now. Uh, that was originally a community suggestion, and we were dead set on having the MI eight as the counterpart to uh, the CH fifty three in GM. But then we almost like I always discounted the MI two because it was this little obscure looking helicopter that was my need not really anything but it did everything somehow but then uh we got a pitch for that and a bit more people were more asking about what about the mi2 and uh, we had community members look into it a bit further and, and giving us some nice insights technical documents uh, a, a huge batch of research into the vehicle as well I ended up then purchasing some, some documents and, and um, guides on the MI2 in East Germany to be super clear on that side, because originally it's a, it's a Polish helicopter. And then it was essentially love it sec a second side, because it's this little hopper, or the hop hide, that just does everything, and then some more. So at that point, when we realized what kind of multi-role vehicle that is, almost like the M013 of the skies, well, it became a must-have. I personally like the Crop Duster variant. It's the most important variant. Alright. Next question. Besides Arma, what are your favorite games? And why Gothic? The best German game ever made. So I will answer the first half of the question. We've talked a lot about trucking and that stuff 
and no, not truck simulator, but transport fever. I really do enjoy transport fever because of trains and trucks, and uh, I do uh, use it to, well, gather energy and motivation and um, inspiration for more trucks for GM and trains. I have a very good story about transport fever. I mentioned in, in the, the question about the, the terrains, um, the original, uh, sorry, yeah, the, the original refilling terrain was this small area, 10 by 10 kilometers. And it was kind of like a thing happening on the side. That was around 2014, 2015, after, after we did the trip to refilling. And it was just kind of like a project on the side, not, not progressing much. But I was playing Transport Fever. I must have been 2016 then. And I had a sudden moment of clarity as I was building a train line and I was placing trees on the left and on the right. I was landscaping it. And I thought, wait a minute, what, what am I doing here? Why am I, why am I playing this game when I could be doing the exact same thing in armor and building something productive? And that's when I went back to working on Weferlingen and converted it then eventually to the 20 by 20 kilometer terrain because I, I realized, wait I a minute. I remember that day when you realized that. Yeah, it was like an epiphany. Like, why, what, what, I'm wasting time here. Um, but I have to agree, Transfer Fever is a really nice game. Uh, the War Game series in total, I have over a, a thousand hours for sure. Uh, but the question specifically said, why Gothic? And that's a, that's, that's pinpoint accuracy question. Um, originally GM came with eight voices, eight German voices. I added a ninth one. And that is Xardas from Gothic. So this will be this will mean nothing to most English listeners, and it will mean the word to the Polish community, to the Czech community, and the German community. And eventually, I would just realize, wait a minute, I've got I've got a bit of a budget now after the GM release. I'm just gonna contact the voice actor for one of the the main characters in the Gothic games. And he had a surprisingly good price. And he's an absolutely lovely human being. And he ended, we, we had a call to arrange uh, the lines and everything and a bit of a, like, a green room simulation call, essentially. Just having a, a chat about things. And he told me his Cold War stories. Because he's been, he's been around. And I, I wouldn't do just telling the story now because I just get fragments. But that was a... So, so many interesting stories from this guy. Absolutely lovely. If you were allowed to own one thing in the GM DLC in real life, which one would that be? Maybe, maybe not. Because my answer would be, I would like to own the entire terrain. <laughs> <laughs> Landowner. Mm -hmm. This is the smart right. answer. The simplest answer to it, but it's not in the spirit of the question. Um, so I would like to own probably a fox. I was uh, gonna say exactly the same. I'm curious to know what your your reasoning is. Um, it's so my reasoning is because it's it's like what people think when they buy a SUV, like they have this all-terrain, all-round vehicle, blah blah blah. But it's actually not. The fox is, and it's huge. It will probably take a lot of money to refuel it and maintain it. Uh, spare parts will probably be a problem in the future. But you can mend it yourself. You can hit it with a wrench and it will work again. And there's not much in electronics. There's no plant obsolescence in there. And it's big enough that you can do definitely good shopping in it. But you can also take it camping probably or do a world round road trip, something like that with it. And if people shoot it, you at least have a, have a protection. So. I think it's a it's a good all round vehicle. Yeah, my reasoning for it is obvious. The obvious answer would be yeah, looks. But then again, how useful would a looks be in in your daily life? Um, a fox can be extremely useful because it has a lot of cargo space in the back. You can convert it to a camper van. And uh, while a lot of people build or or buy old military trucks and convert them into these safari trucks, why not just take that? And uh, you don't even need to do a lot of converting. Just put a bed in the back, a 
a free agent and you're done. And yeah, it's a it's a thing you can actually use. I'm afraid it will actually never happen because of export control and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Probably not, but, but one can always dream. Yeah, but you might get lucky because the French are very relaxed and you can buy a VAB probably. Okay, next question. What was the most fun part of working in this project? Oh, that has to be all the... Oh, there's two things. So I'm going to answer with two things. The first thing is definitely the recording session in the studio we did when we did the radio. Uh, the, the amount of hilarity of uh, mispronunciation that just completely distorted the meaning of the sentence recorded. Uh, just the general fun. Um, also a bit of the stress I found about because I, I organized it and we had a strict plan. We had about, I think, two hour windows per speaker. Um, that was... That was an exhausting day, for sure, but a fun day. And the other was doing the trip to Weferlingen. And it's crazy, because we did that in 2014. Uh, so that is seven years ago now, probably exactly seven years, because I think we went in summer. And we took a lot of pictures of a lot of cobblestone, a lot of uh, manhole covers, and... Yeah, and we just did... A general scouting of the area and identifying the locations that we want to cover for sure and draw inspiration from it if you uh, take in what kind of vegetation ac actually exists and um, that's that's one that's a bonus answer I can give here what's the least fun part of working on this project probably was for me to do the vegetation because it ruined trees for me to to all of you people who have not done vegetation in 3d uh, you enjoy a blissful, unaware life where you walk through a park and you look at a tree and you think, ah, yes, a tree. And then you continue walking on. For me, especially while I was working on, on trees, on, on these typical European trees that we have here in Prague as well, I just constantly got reminded by the trees of how inadequate the trees I was building at the time were. Because, oh God, I was just building this type of tree, like a a a a beech tree, for example, and I was so happy with myself that I finished it and it has a correct form and it looks right and it's all good and lots are even done. And then I look at a beech tree in real life and it looks completely different. I thought, what kind of mess have I built? And so I started noticing these details and regular objects and trees and they started ruining my day. But then eventually I learned this other bit of information about trees and that's called the habitus. I'm not sure if that's the exact term in English as well. But that is a tree's shape and nature is influenced by the environment that it grows up. And I was building trees for a forest because I was using pictures of that tree in the forest as a reference. And then on my, my walk in the park, I looked at a freestanding tree of that same type. And it grows completely different because it doesn't have to compete with other trees for light. And once I realized that, wait a minute, they are different... Um, yeah, this different habitus of a tree, it re I realized that the things that I thought were wrong were actually still correct. They just, these are trees for standing alone, and these are trees for in a forest. All right. So we're getting close to ending this session. So let's head to the final questions. What are your favorite screws? The favorite mistakes? So favorite screws. Um... This this opinion has changed over over the course of the past couple of years. I would definitely say the Phillips head used to be my favorite one because a lot of grip and um, very good screw. But uh, by now I completely changed my opinion and I do prefer Torx screws. I'm out of words. I yes. Okay. All right. I have to say the the hex head on German the in in Zexkant, because it has this beautiful ability that uh, you always you probably run out of the correct I think in English it's called the Allen key, but the thing is you can combine them to get the exact size. So you need just five of them and you can reach any size of hex screw head that you need. So I think the hex is the superior one because of the. I'd tool. like to emphasize I'm containing myself here at the moment. Due to lack of screw experience. 
Uh, I, I don't think this is the... Listen here. What are your... Fi You're gonna have to, to censor this part. What are your favorite fuck-ups? I think this is more direct. <laughs> no, I think the question was meant literal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Oh, it's a good question, All right? So... <laughs> I don't know if I should go to the next one, or... <laughs> are you guys gonna give a serious answer for this? <laughs> okay. Alright. I think this could be considered one as well. Uh -huh. Okay, what's the next one? Alright, next question. So, uh, this one I, I picked. Uh, will this civilian infection be expanded? So, the, the way we, we... To answer this question, people have to understand how we deal with the civilian infection. We don't necessarily deliberately plan to expand the civilian faction. The civilian faction for us is is more or less a byproduct of the military factions. So if there's a vehicle used by the military that can be, with small modifications, be used as a civilian asset, we do it. So the examples will be the, the uh, Unimog truck or the, um, the um, Beetle or the uh, Trabant or, or the... the um, B0105 helicopter, um, but we don't have specific assets only for civilians, and that is very unlikely to change as um, the primary focus of ARMA and GM is still warfare. Yes, we are aware of the fact that civilians do also play a huge role in, in warfare, but the, the, the amount of time spent on a civilian asset on a pure civilian asset in, in my opinion is better spent on a military asset that could potentially be reused as a um, civilian vehicle nevertheless expanding the civilian truck lineup is definitely a thing on the list kickball quick game bate bola jogo rápido um, I'm gonna be asking about some different themes. I'm gonna ask just five themes, and you guys are gonna be answering your favorite on each topic without any need to explain yourselves. All right, it's a good way to know you guys quickly, and not necessarily armor related. So, all right, kickball, quick game. Your favorite color? A golden yellow. Green. All right, favorite movie. Top Gun. Uh, Deutschland 83. All right, that counts as well. Okay, favorite song. Anything metal. You gotta have your favorite one. Quick game, quick ball. Quick. Okay then, Julian. Right now, I gotta say Phil Collins in the air tonight. Ooh, romantic. Mm. All right. <laughs> a meal you like? Goulash. Favorite meal? Goulash. Grünkohl, which is kale, but prepared correctly. So That's none of this health nonsense. We put sausage in it, as Germans do. <laughs> and for the last one, favorite submachine gun? MP2. Uh, of course, the MP5. Anything else is blasphemous. But I think this is a good place to end the AMA now. We've done about an hour, 30 plus questions. We've shown a lot about the history of GM, of the decisions we've made and the things we had to cut and the things we tried and didn't work out and gave you a really nice look into our archives and uh, resources that we have used to develop GM over the past few years. I hope it was very interesting because for us, the past two years since release have been extremely interesting and the development time of course so with the closing words i can only tell you that we are absolutely grateful for the support of the community so far and you will always be able to reach us in the usual spots on the official forums on our servers in discord and online and of course through twitter and with that goodbye
Te teeny, where, why are you pointing that gun at me? I'm, I'm not, no, I'm not coming with you, no. I'm not coming with you to preserve, please, no. No, no.